After graduating from the Courtauld Institute in 1975, Jeannie catalogued the picture collection at Royal Holloway College at the University of London, bought by the philanthropist Thomas Holloway, uh, a catalog that was published in 1982, a year after Jeannie had worked on the exhibitions on Holloway's at Agnews. Later, she was the curator for the Treasures from Kent House's loan exhibitions for the Canterbury Festival in 1984 and for painting the West Country House and Garden for the Holborn Museum in Bath in 2006. From 1983 to 1986, Jeannie was curator of paintings at the Merchant Taylor's Hall in the City of London. She also worked in a private capacity for the Gage family at Furl, pa uh, Furl Place in Sussex to catalog their collection and has recently been engaged by the Baring family to work on the collection of Alexander, first Baron Ashburton. Jeannie was the co-author with Charlotte Gere of the Art Collections of Great Britain and Ireland, commissioned by the National Art Collections Fund in 1984, and has published extensively on the archive of the 19th century collector and patron Joseph Gillett, is it Gillett or Gillett? Gillett, <laughs> of Birmingham, um, in the Journal of the History of Collections and elsewhere, for which she was granted a visiting fellowship from the Paul Mellon Center and a personal research grant from the British Academy. New York audiences will know Jeannie's work from her contributions to the exhibition that Daniela was mentioning at Bart Graduate Center on, William, uh, on Thomas Hope in 2007 and prior to that on William Beckford in 2001. Since 2009, supported by a curatorial research grant from the Paul Mellon Center, Jeannie has been working on a revision of the British pictures in the Royal Collection, which were originally published in the 1960s by the late Oliver, Sir Oliver Millar, then surveyor of the Queen's pictures. This project will keep her busy for another three years, so we're glad she took out time out today uh, to talk with us about Thomas Hope, collector of contemporary and old master pictures. Please welcome Jeannie Chappelle. On the 29th of March, 1804, Joseph Farrington, the diarist, reported a discussion at the Academy Club about Thomas Hope's recently finished house in Duchess Street. And I quote, West, Benjamin West, said it was the finest specimen of true taste that is to be found either in England or in France. Burney, that's Charles, Charles Burney, the classical scholar and book collector, declared that if the best parts were taken out of the 10 best houses in England, they would not together make up so much of good taste as in that single instance. Two days later, Farrington went to Hope's house with, amongst others, George Dance, the architect, who told him that impressed by its novelty, and I quote, good might be done as it might contribute to emancipate the public taste from that rigid adherence to a certain style of architecture and of finishing and unshackle the artists. I would like to try and explore the reasons for these opinions, the importance of Hope's great achievements. In a time of change and innovation and his background, which must have inf influenced and inspired him. Ten years earlier, the Hope families had arrived in England, as Daniela explained, fleeing their homes in Holland. We know little about Thomas Hope himself, although huge amounts of information of the Hopes as bankers is available in the publication of 1974 by Martin Buist, at Spes Non Fracta, the Hope motto, but hope is not yet crushed. Copious bank records of Hope and Company are in Rotterdam and available to the public, but neither personal papers nor Hope's great triumphs, his two houses in London and in Surrey, survive. Thomas Hope was born in Amsterdam, which with London and Paris was one of the major centers of the art market in Europe at that time, and the hugely prosperous city housed a very large number of private collections. For collectors, there was an abundance of choice, and very many agents and advisors were involved in the art market. Hope's family were amongst the most cosmopolitan. They lived à la Française, they spoke French and English. An attempt to establish the traditions of Thomas Hope's background 
will enable us to consider his reasons for and the pattern of his collecting. To understand Thomas Hope, however, I will first consider his father and his collection. The concept of collecting was in the family. John, or Jan Pope, was born in Rotterdam in 1737 and had a thorough education. He moved to Amsterdam and joined Hope and Company Bank in 1762. He was a director of the East India Company, an alderman and a lead leading figure in Dutch politics and social life. His inherited and accumulated wealth in that the family plowed back the profits into the company enabled him to buy many Dutch properties, to travel endlessly between those properties and to travel elsewhere on the continent. John Hope was a partner in the bank and had slightly less than half shares in the company. He collected, he bought privately from other collectors, from auction sales, and he commissioned works of art. Much like his son Thomas was to do in his turn. John Hope went on a grand tour in 1760, where in Rome he met key figures in artistic circles, Cardinal Albani, J.J. Winkelmann, and Piranesi, who were all interested in the classical world and the discovery of the antique. Hope bought in Rome, Florence, Venice, and in Paris. His collection was very well documented. Three extensive manuscript catalogues, which were compiled in the 1770s and 1780s, and a catalog inventory published in about 1782 all survive. All three catalogues were purchased by Fritz Lucht, the great collector and art historian, in 1947, and are now in lo on loan in the RKD in The Hague. John Hope also bought Dutch and Flemish pictures, and one of his most important acquisitions in 1771, with his uncle Adrian Hope, was the entire collection of 230 pictures from the Bishop brothers, Jan and Peter of Rotterdam, rich Mennonite merchants and close friends of the Hope family. Jan Bishop, who died that year, was described as a true rough Dutchman. He had built up their haberdashery business and their collection was housed in what was called the Bishop's Palace. John Hope weeded out 42 of the less important pictures and inherited Adrian's share on his death in 1781. Also in that year, 1771, John Hope bought more pictures following the death of another famous collector, Gerrit Braunkamp, a successful timber merchant whose collection and way of life was in many ways similar to Hope's own. The Braunkamp collection was one of the most famous in Europe. Of more than 378 pictures, mostly high quality Dutch and Flemish, but also Italian. They were housed in what was described as Le Temple des Arts, a significant description given the Temple of the Arts that Thomas Hope was to create in London about 30 years later. 20,000 people viewed the Braunkamp collection when it was put up for sale. The population of Amsterdam at that time was only 300,000. Among the works that John Hope bought were those by Metsu and Rembrandt, his interests ranged widely from pictures and sculpture to curiosities of all kinds. He was also interested in costume and in antiquities, both of which interests were to become overwhelming passions of his son Thomas. John Hope's collection was carefully arranged and extremely well organized with cardboard labels provided for visitors to identify the artists represented. Hope employed a curator Jan Vubbles, described as a not too gifted painter of small seascapes. He was also a major art dealer. The posthumous sale of his pictures in 1792 contained 591 works. Dutch houses did not have galleries as such. Collections were hung throughout the interiors, in rooms and corridors, even in the kitchens. Collections were easily accessible by appointment or publicized visiting hours, 
and indeed visitors to Dutch cities expected to be able to view private collections, which were made public through guidebooks and were recorded in inventories. This was not the case in London at that time and must be considered as an important aspect when considering Thomas Hope's approach to his collections at, hi at his house in London. John Hope was generous and hospitable and he acted much in the, in the tradition of Dutch collectors. Very many distinguished visitors from all over Europe would have seen his collection, including Joshua Reynolds, who recorded his visits in Flanders and, and, and Holland in 1781, and which were published in 1797. John Hope's collection was compared to, the, to that of the Stadtholder, Prince Willem V of Orange. His collection was the first to be opened to the public in The Hague in 1774. However, 20 years later, while the Stadtholder fled the invading Napoleonic forces to England at the same time as the Hopes, his collection was seized and sent to Paris. When returned, those works were to become the foundation of the national collection now in the Moritz House in The Hague. John Hope died in 1784, aged 47. His sons Thomas, Adrian and Henry Philip were all still minors. Mrs. Hope sold 99 pictures that year, and when she died five years later, the three sons inherited a massive estate and the pictures. In late 1794, the brothers fled Amsterdam. Thomas went to Berlin and then to Vienna. From 1798, Thomas settled in London, where, as described by Francis Haskell, and I quote, the old aristocratic names were now joined by hugely rich bankers and merchants of Russian, Dutch, and German origin, John Julius Angerstein, the Hopes, the Bearings. Thomas had traveled extensively between 1787 and 1796 in France, Italy, Spain, Portugal, North Africa, and the Ottoman Empire. He had traveled in Sicily with George Augustus Wallace, who became a dealer in Italian and Spanish works. Hope had a curious nature, by which I mean he had curiosity, <laughs> and was a skilled draftsman, and he drew extensively during all his travels. Much like his father in Italy, he bought antiquities, sculpture, Italian old masters, and he commissioned works of art. In 1799, Hope bought, Thomas Hope bought an Adam house on the corner of Mansfield Street and Duchess Street, an increasingly fashionable area of London, and close to his cousin Henry's house in Cavendish Square. Here, Hope created an amazing platform to house and show off his own and his inherited collection. He combined his all-embracing passion for the arts, architecture, sculpture, painting, and the decorative arts in styles which ranged from Greek, Egyptian, Ita it uh, Indian, and French. There was an organ in the picture gallery. Throughout the house, there were mixed and varying textures, gold and marble, and the smell of incense. He transformed the building into his temple for the arts, a theatrical sequence of rooms carefully orchestrated for display, not for comfort. And perhaps I just should explain the plan a little bit. Uh, the, uh, all of these rooms were on, um, on, the, on the first floor of the house, uh, your second floor, and, and you would have approached by the staircase on, on the left and then proceeded in the, in, this, in, the, in the order which was intended. At night, the rooms dazzled with vibrant colors. The overall effect was evidently overwhelming. Hope's passion for things Greek and Roman was evident throughout, and much in the same way that the art of the ancient Greeks and Romans was public, so Hope encouraged access and admiration of his various trophies. He opened the house on the 7th of May, 1802, with a big party. A thousand people were invited, including the Prince of Wales. These guests described 
as persons of the first rank and fashion in the, in the country. 16 rooms were opened to receive the visitors, which were decorated with great taste and very brilliantly lighted up so as to excite great admiration. There were 250 wax lights in the different rooms. Hope loved parties, and sometimes the surrounding streets were so clogged with carriages that it was impossible to get near the house. With a blockade on continental travel, this was a critical moment when access was supremely important. This coincided also with a real feeling for the promotion of a national school of art and the practical encouragement of artists and craftsmen. At that time, very few major collections were accessible. For instance, William Beckford's Font Hill was out of bounds. The Prince of Wales's collections at Carlton House and Brighton were only seen by his immediate circles. The Marquis of, of Stafford, described as the richest nobleman in Europe, opened his collection in 1806 in Cleveland House, St. James's. The purpose-built gallery was designed by Charles Hethcote Tatham, Hope's architect, who was building a reputation for his designs for galleries in London and country houses. Hope endorsed his own creation through his great published work, Household Furniture and Interior Decoration of 1807, in which he outlined his attitudes to design and manufacture and his concern for the improvement of, quote, public taste. He imposed his distinctive and elegant style throughout the introduction of neoclassical forms with Greek and Roman motif, using his own show house with its glittering and original interiors, containing a melange of splendiferous ancient and modern contents. He, this is his design, uh, probably an early design, but it, it indicates the importance to him of what his picture gallery was going to look like. The first gallery at Duchess Street was about 96 feet by 24 feet, top lit, heated by three stoves and fireproof. And with the most ingenious and unfamiliar, simple, fluted, baseless Greek Doric columns, the design was to be hugely influential for future galleries, both private and public. It is shown here in the, in the next slide, um, with the walls covered with um, uh, with the walls covered with curtains, and in the anonymous graving published in 1824, it shows the gallery with works in situ. In 1819, a second gallery was built, the so-called Flemish Gallery, two-storied, 42 feet long, 19 feet wide, also top lit with colza oil lamps was added by the architect William Atkinson to house John Hope's collection of about 100 Dutch and, Philip, D Dutch and Flemish paintings, which had also been inherited by Thomas's brother, Henry Philip. Hope's large and varied collection of pictures, Old Masters Contemporary, ranged from the sublime in these two exquisite pictures to the ridiculous, which are amongst his contemporary works, which um, these are two examples. His marriage to the immensely popular and pretty Louisa Beresford in 1806 brought Thomas Hope great happiness, and in the following year, the purchase of another house, the Deep Dean, in a beautiful landscape in Surrey, about 26 miles south of London. Once again, Hope could indulge his passion for all the arts and for gardening, and he created another setting for more of his collections. He expanded the house in 1818, and in 1823, it eventually had 33 bedrooms. Hope had more space there to display sculpture, paintings, and furniture. A reconstruction of the picture hang can be made room by room from the publications of 1826 and 1841, at which time it would also have included the works collected by Thomas's son, Henry Thomas, another connoisseur, collector, and author. 
Rapid mention must just be made of a few of Hope's contemporary banker collectors. William Gordon Coesvelt, about whom not a lot is known, described as a native of the West Indies, he was manager of Hope and Company's office in Amsterdam and became their agent in Spain from 1808, and he collected magnificent Spanish paintings. The poet Samuel Rogers, and a friend of Hope, inherited banking shares from his father and was significantly inspired by the collections at Duchess Street and adopted many of Hope's ideas in the creation of his house, 22 St. James's Place. At Starhead, Henry Hall, banker and patron, collected at the same time as John Hope. And Richard Colt Hall, his nephew, the antiquary, like Hope, inherited from, but did not take an active part in Hall's Bank. Hope died in 1831, following an inspection on the roof of, of the Deep Dean of the lighting of the picture gallery. The house was sold in 1920, became a hotel, then British Rail offices, and was de demolished in 1969. The paintings were inherited by Hope's granddaughter, Henrietta, who married the sixth Duke of Newcastle. <coughs> he died in 1879. Of their five children, the last, Francis Hope Pelham Clinton Hope, the eighth Duke, was declared bankrupt in 1894 and died in 1941. In the meantime, 83 pictures were sold en bloc to Asher Wertheimer, the, the, the dealer in New Bond Street, in 1898. A further 20, mostly Dutch pictures, were sold in 1910 to the painter, collector, and dealer Charles, Charles Fairfax Murray. A final dispersal of all the Hope heirlooms was made at auction in 1917 with disappointing results. One of Hope's great ambitions, never materialized, was that of a peerage. Apart from the banker Robert Smith, who became first Baron Carrington in 1797, and that after much fuss as George III considered bankers were tradesmen, the only contemporary of Hope's to be so granted was Alexander Baring in 1835.